Um, good evening, you're very welcome uh, to our timely webinar session for our Young Professionals Network, focusing on the outcome of COP26 and its implications for climate action policy here in Ireland. Uh, my name is Darrett Moriarty, I work in communications at the IEA, and I also chair our YPN. Um, last weekend, as many of you will be aware from all of the media commentary around this, uh, COP26 concluded, where the Glasgow Climate Compact was agreed. Um, many commentators acknowledged that you know, significant progress had been made, um, but also that, you know, there was a sense that not enough had been done to get us back on track to limit to 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, and Conservative MP Alok Sharma, who served as COP26 president in his concluding remarks, you know, said that achieving the target of limiting temperature increases to 1.5 was still alive. But he said, you know, with a faint pulse. So, you know, not a particularly rosy outlook um, on the conclusion, even though there were really significant pledges made along the way over the course of the two weeks. And um, to get stuck into all of that and to discuss the outcome, we're absolutely delighted this evening uh, to be joined by a very distinguished panel of speakers, including Green Party MEP for Dublin, Kieran Cuff, uh, Dr. Hannah Daly of University College Cork, and uh, Robbie Ahern of Airgrid. Uh, before I formally introduce our speakers this evening, let me just briefly run through some of our housekeeping issues, which are probably all very accustomed to at this stage. Uh, we do want to hear from you, the audience, throughout the session this evening. Please get in touch via our Q&A function, uh, which you should see in the bottom of your screen on Zoom. Uh, we would ask you that you identify yourself and any affiliation that you do have when you're posing a question. And then you can also, of course, get involved in the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA and the hashtag YPN. Uh, the full discussion this evening is on the record. Um, so it will go up on our YouTube and our podcast channels afterwards if you want to give it a listen back or watch it back. And uh, everything the speakers say can be, can be attributed to them and repeated. Um, in terms of format this evening, our speakers are going to give initial brief overviews of, of their perspectives on COP. It'll be initial five to seven minutes reflections on the key takeaways. And then we'll kick off with some questions. I have one or two ready and we'll see how the discussion goes. And then also we'd be delighted to hear from you uh, once we get to the, the Q&A session. You don't have to wait until the, the, the speakers finish, you know, get your questions in throughout the session and we can get to them uh, once they finish up. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce our speakers now. So Kieran Cuff is Green MEP representing Dublin following his election in 2019. In the European Parliament, he's very active on a number of different committees. He serves on the Industry Research and Energy Committee, as well as the Transport and Tourism Committee. Uh, he previously served as a Dublin City Councillor, a TD for Dunleary, and he was Minister of State for Horticulture, Sustainable Travel, Planning and Heritage. Um, Dr. Hannah Daly is a lecturer in Sustainable Energy and Energy Systems Modelling at the University College Cork. Her research focuses on modelling and developing sustainable pathways for the energy system encompassing energy access, climate change and air pollution. Before she joined UCC, Hannah worked with the International Energy Agency as an energy modeller from 2015 to 2019. She completed a PhD in energy and transport modeling in 2012 and her BSc in mathematics in 2009, both of them coming from UCC. Uh, Robbie Ahern serves as head of future networks with Airgrid, a position he's held since February 2020. Uh, he has worked with Airgrid, the STEMI state body responsible for operating Ireland's national grid for over 16 years in a number of senior roles, including head of public engagement and head of new connections. He received his MSc in electrical power systems from the University of Bath in 2013, and he completed his degree in electrical engineering in UCC in 2003. So a very UCC heavy panel. Um, I'm going to start first with Kieran Cuff. Um, it's over to you, Kieran, on your initial reflections of COP how you think it went and, and what your main takeaways were. Yeah, I guess I'm still digesting it all um, uh, less than a week after it all wound up. Uh, I actually went uh, to the start of COP, then was back in Ireland, then back in Brussels, then went up to the end of COP and then back in Brussels. Actually, I feel like I spent most of the last two weeks on trains talking to people about COP. But COP, yeah, it, it's like an electric picnic for policy wonks. Um, and it is an extraordinary gathering of tens of thousands of people with um, varying degrees of understanding and policy interest in climate change. And actually, the, uh, the, on going up to COP um, two and a half uh, weeks ago, uh, there was actually a special train to the COP that kicked off from Amsterdam, came down to Brussels, kicked, uh, picked up a few of us, then went to London, and then we walked from St Pancras to Houston and took a train up to Glasgow. But that train was pretty amazing because um, it was a pretty high powered group and we were seen off by Franz Timmermans, the vice president of the European Commission, 
um, with responsibility really for, for climate action. Um, and he's great at kind of enthusing people. And on the train, there was quite a few people who are at the heart of the kind of movement of Europe towards climate action. So like the head of Eurostar was, was there, the head of land transport from the European Commission. So a lot of people who know their stuff backwards. And there were some very good conversations on the train. And, but we were also joined by a lot of young climate activists. And actually on the train up from London, Greta was, was on board. Uh, and so there was a huge crowd at Glasgow to meet us. And I guess the, the start of COP is dominated by the you know, high level political speeches and mostly rhetoric, but all well and good. And then the meat of the COP is really in the detailed uh, negotiations in, in week one uh, uh, by, by people who are skilled negotiators. And then in the last few days, the, the, the politicians come back in. So I wasn't there in the middle, but then I came back uh, at the end and it was fascinating on the Saturday afternoon sitting in the plenary room uh, where there was, I could watch kind of Timmermans working one side of the room and then John Kerry from uh, the Climate Envoy from the US working the other side of the room and just trying to keep the lines of communication open. And you just have to remember about COP, it's an attempt to bring together almost 200 separate nations by consensus. And that's why the lowest common den denominator is set very low. It's really hard to get people uh, to agree. And here we are 25 years later, 26 years later, whatever it is, um, agonizingly trying to move things forward. And I, I, for me, it was my fourth COP and I was in uh, Cancun as head of delegation 11 years ago. But back then we were simply trying to keep COP alive, there was a real danger that the process would absolutely fail um, at that stage during the middle of the global financial crisis. But it was kept alive and then we had Durban and then we had Paris. And Paris, as Philip Boucher Hayes has pointed out, was an extraordinary achievement in diplomacy. And it wasn't a make or break within two weeks or even one year. It took many years to make things happen. And I think the UK government maybe try to put thing, bring things together at, in a very short time frame of perhaps 12 months. And I, but I would have expected more. And there was a real opportunity there. I think it was quite telling that it was India and Australia who in some senses just didn't really um, go the extra mile at COP. And surely the UK uh, with these countries as part of the Commonwealth could have gone a lot further with them. So I found that quite disappointing, to be honest. And yes, there was the methane pledge and the forestry pledge, but the devil is in the detail. And if you drill down into the detail of those pledges, they're maybe not as substantive as they were um, spun, dare I say it, by, by the UK, by the UK uh, government. But look, you know, I, I'm, I like so many people, I'm torn between the enormity of the climate crisis and the fact that for a huge amount of people they're not waking up every day and thinking about climate change. I mean I'm in the European Parliament we have 75 green MEPs but that's only 10% of the Parliament so there's 90% of the political representation at European level who aren't spending an enormous amount of their agenda on, on climate and I think you have to remember that and it puts the gains in context. So it's no wonder that India at the last moment said, look, it's not a phase out of coal, it's a phase down. We're, funnily enough, this week in the European Parliament, several of my, uh, of my mainland European colleagues for whom English isn't their mother tongue said, phase down, is this a word? Uh, and I said, well, it's a new one to me, but um, it's it certainly come out a cop. Um, and it, it's, it's part of the language. Look, a lot of achievements. I was delighted that Ireland signed up to the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, uh, headed by Costa Rica and Denmark, but Ireland did join at COP26. And I guess from where I'm sitting in, in the kind of the political sphere, we can talk about all, numbers all day. We can talk about the 55%, the Fit for 55 package in Europe which is 13, 14, 15 separate pieces of legislation that we'll be working on for the next 
couple of years. We can talk about the 51 percent um, uh, reduction of emissions in Ireland, but ultimately it comes down to the policy measures that will actually achieve that. So I'm shadowing or, or following the aviation file in Europe. So I'll be looking at, look, what are the sustainable aviation fuels? How can we get them uh, off the ground, if you pardon the pun? Uh, and it won't be easy. The, the biofuels, where there's all kinds of challenges and problems uh, of, of kind of monocrops and deforest or uh, of sucking up all the world's agricultural land. The synthetic biofuels, where we're really still in the experimental stage, uh, it's easier, let's say, to do deal with other aspects of transport. And it's a, in the Irish context, it's a no brainer that we need to improve public transport, get active travel with walking and cycling, uh, uh, improve. And wearing my kind of hat as a spatial planner, make sure that people don't have to commute long distances to and from where they want to go. So uh, having more homes in Dublin City, having more places to work in the commuter belt so that we reduce the need to travel. All of this stuff comes into the mix. At a European level, I was disappointed that we were not seeing more movement on rail, on modal shift of getting stuff off roads, onto railways, whether it's freight or people, uh, railways and inland waterways and short sea shipping, which I always stumble over as a phrase. That's what we need to make happen in Europe. It's agonizingly slow in Europe to make this stuff happen. And in the Irish context, my gosh, we've talked around the houses so often about improving public transport, getting people walking and cycling. But I think certainly, uh, and here's my political bias, I think Eamon Ryan is really pushing to try and make public transport really uh, work. Uh, I think the ambitious aims for 80% uh, electricity by 2030 is kind of eye-watering as a target and would be extraordinary if we can achieve it. And then in agriculture, it will it is a huge challenge to bring ag on board. But finally, we're seeing the discussion of feeds, seeds, and uh, various factors that can reduce our emissions there. So pulling right back to conclude on Glasgow, um, look, it, it did achieve a fair amount of what it set out to do. And after 26 iterations of this process, interestingly, kicked off by Angela Merkel back in 1995, and she's not quite left the room yet, but in, in politics years, um, they're a bit like dog years. There's an awful lot of them, and 25 years is an extraordinary amount of time. But we are seeing climate action happen on the ground in Europe in the legislation we're dealing with. I think the world is following suit. I think the package in the US, it's not as good as what we're doing in Europe, but it's quite extraordinary to have a US president talking about climate change with conviction. Um, and it's such a change from where we were two years ago. So some movement in the right direction. The gap between politics and science is still very large. It's frustrating, but it's the only game we have. And we just have to keep trying to push, push things along even though it's it's so frustrating. I'll leave it at that. Liam Kieran, look, that's, that's a really fantastic and helpful overview to set the scene, I think, uh, from where you're sitting in Brussels. Um, and obviously you you outlined your trails and your travels up and down the cops. So it was really good to hear that as well. Robbie, we'll turn to you. And I mean, Kieran pushed as he was coming towards the end there, that 70% renewable or electricity targets, you know, AirGrid has a, has a recent report out touching on that very, very item. So I'd be, I'd be really interested to hear your take and your analysis on COP from where you're sitting as, as, as head of future networks in AirGrid. Over to you, Robbie. Yep, great. Thanks very much, Dara. Look, I'd agree with a huge amount of what uh, Kiran has said there. I think there was really good progress in COP on some things around greenhouse gas emissions, climate finance and international cooperation. Uh, and there were some good side deals as well. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, mm -hmm. There wasn't enough to ensure that we can keep uh, below 1.5 degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels. And look, that's disappointing at the end of the day. But I think, look, as we go from COP to COP, look, one thing that really struck me this year, there was a really a huge amount of focus leading up to COP in the media around it. And I think that's, that's really a positive because it shows that people 
general the average person in society is a lot more engaged or is starting to get more engaged and i think look from each year we are making greater progress towards what, what we need to achieve look i'd agree with kieran i and I, I there's 200 countries it's very very difficult to achieve a consensus on something like this but but i think progress is being made so i, I would take some positives here uh, from cop I think the critical factor, though, um, uh, I think uh, to, to kind of maybe think about beyond COP, the critical factor really is about moving beyond pledges and, and into action because the time is not on our side. We have to uh, commence, uh, start taking action uh, in parallel with getting the pledges into the right place. And look, with, I'm going to focus in Ireland and particularly the electricity industry, because look, that's my uh, area of expertise. And I have to say, look, as an engineer with a young family, it's an incredibly exciting time to be working in the electricity sector and really a privilege to be involved in work uh, that helps ensure our world and Ireland is sustainable for future generations. Uh, look. In Ireland, we have uh, very significant ambitions. Kieran mentioned it there uh, around the electricity targets. The recent climate action plan really pushes it out uh, in that context. And I think electricity, as we, it really is a central component of decarbonizing our broader economy. It's not just about decarbonizing electricity, but but if you decarbonize electricity, that can play a really important role in, in other areas like heat and transport as well. Thinking back to COP and COP, we launched a platform. Uh, we 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 took we took the took the opportunity to launch a project we called Shaping Our Electricity Future. And in shaping, really, we set out a blueprint for how the electricity system in Ireland needs to change in the coming years. So it's moving kind of into that action space and setting out on a page really what needs to be done. It provides an outline of the key developments Airgrid believe needs to be done from an electricity grid from how we engage with communities, how we operate our power system, and also our electricity market, which underpins all of our electricity bills, how they all need to change in the coming decade. And this is a really important step on a journey out to uh, full decarbonization and net zero out into the future. The project we call Shaping Our Electricity Future, and at the very heart of that, and a key part of it was engagement with all sectors of society. And I really cannot emphasize the importance of that as we look as we look to transition our society over the coming decade. In shaping, uh, we had the deepest, broadest engagement program of uh, any utility in Ireland to date on a project like this. So in the first half of this year, we would have spoken to pretty much every county council in Ireland. We would have held multiple briefings with youth groups, uh, chambers of commerce and rural communities all around the country. Uh, I suppose what was unique really from a, from a shaping our electricity future perspective is we had a deliberative assembly as well, where we took 99 random people uh, and I suppose brought them through. I mean, at the end of the day, climate, all of this space, it is really complex. It was an important opportunity for us to take people through it, talk to them, give them a go through it a number of days and, uh, and I suppose get their views then at the end of that on, on the, how they thought the electricity system needed to evolve. So it's kind of basically our version of the Citizens Assembly, which I think has been internationally recognized as being very successful. And obviously, look, we complemented that with engagement with experts in the industry. And look, we got a huge response. Like we got an order of magnitude more than we would normally get. 500 responses from the public, uh, 100 responses from the industry. And these were really good responses, detailed, considered responses. We were absolutely delighted with that. Uh, and that look, it allowed us to reach out into all sectors of, of society and respond to people's views. And, and really, again, I just think that's so important. Engagement is, is going to be crucial to the decarbonization journey. Like we have to bring society along with us, uh, not just within Airgrid, but I think in all the different areas that we need to decarbonize. We have to win people's hearts and minds to the greatest extent that we can. Then over the summer months, kind of reflecting back to shaping, we were reviewing all of the feedback we got. We carried out detailed simulations. We actually carried out literally tens of millions of simulations. And we developed clear action plans on what we believe needs to be done uh, over the coming decade. And we published it at COP26. And really what it does is it sets out a blueprint 
of what the power system will look like in 2030, how the electricity grid needs to be developed, how we're going to continue to engage in society and how we will operate the future electricity system and market. These are all, the power system in 2030 is going to be very different from an economic, from a physics uh, perspective. To give you an overview of what we see it look like as well, look, the power system is going to carry way more electricity than it ever has before. And most of that's going to come from renewables. Like we anticipate 5,000 megawatts of offshore wind, an additional 1,300 megawatts of onshore wind, 1,000 megawatts of solar, a fast developing sector. And what really jumped out to us, and I think it really kind of goes back to that point about the desire of people to take play an active role uh, in, um, in, in climate change and mitigation, we're going to put 500 megawatts of microgeneration. So that's quarter of a million homes, farms, buildings that are going to play an active role in providing generation onto the grid. The coal will be phased out over the next decade with natural gas catering for times when the wind is low and the solar is low. And at the same time, our demand is going to increase by upwards of 50%, which books international trends really, but it's, it's to facilitate large energy users like data centers, pharma, semiconductor plants, that electrification of heat and transport, and also making sure we have the grid we need to cater for our economy at large, like our population growth, new commercial and industrial customers. And I think sometimes in electricity, demand perspective has been Dublin centric. The global tech companies are, are, uh, have a, have, are, are very focused on Dublin Look for, for many different reasons. But as part of shaping, we heard a lot of feedback about the importance about looking beyond Dublin and really we reflected that. Look, we recognize the scale of challenge that's ahead of us is not going to be easy. I'm looking at it from an electricity perspective. Like we're talking about 40 new grid projects, a billion euros on top of another, an existing 2.2 billion euros of projects. Public acceptance is going to be hard. There's a lot of talk at the moment around electricity prices and justifiably so. Security of supply as well, not just this year, but every year out to the end of the decade and beyond. But I think, look, shaping really was to was to look to develop a robust economic and deliverable plan that kind of facilitates that transition from where we are today to where we need to be at the end of the decade on a more renewable based system and look i think ireland it's sometimes people throw their hands up and say well what's ireland is only a small country i think it's crucial that ireland plays its part uh, and and takes practical actions and sets challenging targets to ensure that temperatures don't go above one and a half percent and look we found cop really good um, i think it's it's it really shows there's a, a coalition of I, I suppose momentum starting to develop and i think look our project like shaping our electricity future look blueprints like that provide, uh, I suppose, provide, I suppose, a clear roadmap on how things need to evolve over the coming decade. That's it, Darren. Robbie, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks very much. And look, you mentioned loads there. I'm sure we'll get stuck into some of that in the, in the discussion uh, later. So, so yeah, look, there's a couple of questions already coming in, so, so please keep them coming. Um, Hannah, we'll come to you, come to you last, and, and certainly not least, um, you know, you, you've really... Um, carved out a fantastic role as a, as a, as a commentator on, 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 on all things uh, climate action and, and, and modelling and systems around transport and, and, and we're delighted to have you this evening so um, over to you for your reflections on, 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 on your take on all of this and uh, you know please feel free to disagree with some of the some of the comments of the previous speakers more interesting discussion. Thanks a lot Dara thanks for having me and, and happy to, to be here this evening. Um, I think like a lot of people, I'm grappling to come to sort of a simple conclusion about what COP, what happened at COP and, and, and how I feel about it, um, because there's a huge mix of things that happened uh, from and, and they can be interpreted in so many different ways. So if we look at the, the projections that various uh, modeling groups came out with about what the what the temperature outcome as a result of the, the key new um, NDCs, these 2030 commitments for different countries and their and their net zero 2050 or 2060 2070 targets the temperature outcome in 20 uh, 2100 ranges from 2.7 to 2.9 degrees which would be a disaster you know this is really far exceeding the paris agreement goals of of limiting warming to well below two degrees and um and, and striving for 1.5. But at the lower end, or at the most ambitious sort of scale, if we take all the all of the pledges and say that, okay, they'll be met, 
uh, we'll reach a 1.8 degree world in 2100. And that is phenomenal. That is actually huge progress for the first time. The sort of projection of, of, of a certain set of actions goes uh, below two degrees, which is something really to celebrate. You know, there, there is a lot to celebrate here. Um, but but you know it's 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 a step towards towards achieving the the full goal, but but never ever a full uh, it, it hasn't gone all the way. Um, you know we've, we've we've heard about disappointment as a result of India you know taming down this um, this um, uh, mention of coal. So there was a goal to phase out coal, and, and India at the last moment brought in a, a phase to, to to phase down coal, and that was um, you know th that was met with huge dismay and disappointment, especially by the youth outside. But we still have to remember that, that India is an extremely poor country and they rely on coal for electricity, which powers their whole society and whole economy. So still half of the people in India don't have access to clean cooking fuels. On a per capita basis, they, consume, they, they emit about 1.3 tonnes of CO2 from coal per capita, whereas Germany is 3.5, you know. Um, the UK, the host of COP recently, uh, until about 2015, had a, had a higher per capita emissions from coal than India. And if you look at our oil and gas and agriculture emissions per capita, the, the developed countries are far, far greater than India. So India's position there was that it is developed countries, it is us who bear the responsibility to phase out fossil fuels first not just them phasing out coal, it is us to do what we can. And we always have to bring this back to Ireland and our, we are a developed country. We have a huge out, um, kind of, uh, huge impact on the climate on a per capita basis. If every country in the world, if every person in the world had the same per capita emissions as we have had historically here, the world would already have warmed to three degrees. You know, so we've we've blown apart. If you take all the historical burden of, of our contribution to the climate, we've we've far blown the, the the like the historical carbon budget. And if you kind of slice up the remaining carbon budget, we only have a few years left at current emissions. So it is really not about 2070, 2050 net zero. It is about what we're emitting today and about how quickly we can we can um, we can bring that down. Um, so I suppose this, and and this 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 goes to what. Um, one of the key kind of catchphrases that I that I heard coming from COP was from Lawrence Tubiano, who's one of the key architects of the Paris Agreement, that greenwashing is the new climate denial. So this is what we all have to really keep an eye on all the time is greenwashing, is, is to understand if climate commitments are meaningful and if they're significant. So we looked at the at the global methane pledge and it's 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 a very good step. 30% is still not enough to meet the 1.5 degree target, but it's still very, very good. And Ireland has committed to 10% reduction now that's you know it's it's, it's more difficult to um, reduce um, methane emissions from agriculture um, but our but our methane emissions have actually grown by 15 percent since 20 um, since 2010 so 10 reduction in methane emissions only gets us back to 2014 2015 levels you know is that fair <laughs> so if we, we can see the 10 percent is is really a, a kind of a poor commitment for, from Ireland PhD student of mine was um was at COP I wasn't there myself um, you know, he, and he talked about the different country pavilions. He said Qatar was there, the highest per capita emissions in the world. They were promising a net zero World Cup. You know, you had Saudi Arabia talking about, you know, flying to the um, to Mars. It's it's a uh, you know, it's it's we have to always look at our fossil fuel consumption and coming back to, to what, what we're doing. And is, is it enough? I think Mary Robinson's intervention was very powerful for a lot of people. And she expressed what a lot of us feel. Uh, and if we really kind of access our emotions and personally, I kind of tend to sort of block off the, the enormity of climate change often because I work on this on a day to day basis. But if I really kind of tap into my emotions, I like most young people, um, I feel really afraid. I feel really angry. And in a lot of ways, I feel powerless as well. Um, and, and this is what we all feel. But I think um, what is really hopeful from this is that the youth movement and the youth pressure putting moral pressure on our leaders that they're not doing enough and that they have to do more and that is very very strong and it's and it's also very very powerful um when i i, I teach i lecture to a lot of undergraduates and postgraduates and, and i feel these emotions coming from they feel in despair I, I i was chatting to my class in sustainable energy this monday about about the cop and um, reflecting on the uh, commitment to end deforestation, you know, a student from, from Brazil just raised his hand and he just kind of raised his ha hands and he said, that's never going to happen in Brazil. He said, it's been promised there will be no ending deforestation in Brazil by 2030 is his opinion of, of his leaders back home. So um, young people have, have a huge role to play. I was looking at the new climate action plan, which is Ireland's target to 
you know, our, 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 our kind of mechanism to, to meeting our very, very huge commitment to have emissions in a decade. There's 475 individual actions in the climate action plan. So there's going to be a huge number of people, you know, each of these actions will require people uh, like, like Robbie and Airgrid, uh, institutions working at different levels, pushing change, very quick change. So there's a huge role to play professionally and, and socially as well. So if you're young people, there's, there's a huge sort of career um, uh, uh, position to, to, to uh, or there's a huge potential to, to bring your career there. And I, I'm often hiring postdocs and PhDs, so please do get in touch. Um, I was also asked to reflect on the major challenges back home. And Robbie kind of rightly pointed to the electricity sector Electrification is the key to decarbonizing the the the, um, uh, the whole energy system. Only responsible now for about fifteen percent of emissions, but it will be required to decarbonize heat and transport. This this key one, I just bring you some some of the broad uh, insights from our modeling because I'm I'm running out of time. But recently led a modeling study which has informed the Climate Change Advisory Council's assessment of carbon budgets with for it, for the energy system. And there's there's three major things. So electrification is absolutely essential if we can't both increase the amount of electricity and 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 half emissions from that, uh, it will be very hard to reach any emissions goals. Um, second is that uh, business as usual energy demands. So in terms of like car kilometers, heating homes, businesses, that's what we call energy service demands and sort of lingo with business as usual energy service demands, it will be very hard to decarbonize the energy system by more than 50%. Um, and with the agriculture sector committing to something between 22 and 30 percent in the climate action plan, that will require the energy system to decarbonize by up to 65 to 70 percent, which is enormously, enormously challenging for the energy system. What it's let me be clear, technologies alone will not get us here. They're very important. So a million EVs is essential, but at the same time, it's not enough in transport. So it has to be about systemic change in terms of how we live, where we live, how we're getting around transport planning like Kieran mentioned, and I think everybody, whatever they're doing in their lives, uh, will, will play a very big role. Um, I'm looking forward to the Q&A, so I'll stop there. Brilliant, Hannah, look, um, absolutely fantastic um, analysis there of, of, of some of the the key the key takeaways coming out of COP and, and your own reflections on it. It's really interesting to hear the insights from your, your own class. Um, you know, obviously you're dealing with them on a weekly and daily basis. Um, so yeah, so look, I mean, that's, that's a, a really powerful um, contribution to the discussion here. So there's, there's a good few questions coming in there. I'm just going to kick off with one of my own because it, it's been touched upon throughout. Um, you know, the fact that these big headline pledges were made and there were significant sort of, you know, achievements. Now, you know, how, how overblown or otherwise the achievements were, you know, time will tell. But I mean, just to list some of them off, you know, 100 countries agreed to slash methane emissions by 30%. You know, over 100 countries um, holding more than 85% of the world's forests said they were going to halt uh, deforestation, which has just been alluded to there by Hannah. And then in India, of course, as was mentioned earlier on, one of the biggest emitters on coal pledged to reach net zero by 2070. Um, I suppose those are some of the biggest headlines that come out. But despite them, there was a real sense that, you know, this was an underwhelming cop. And, and given we're sort of hurtling towards you know, really significant climate disaster by 2030, 2040, you know, was there enough done? And I just suppose I'm interested to get your views on those big pledges. And yes, there's still the sense that it didn't quite deliver what people were hoping for. So Kieran, if I come back to you on that, what's your sense of, of, of that disconnect between the big pledges and then the feeling on the ground among young people who still feel that sense of despair? Just unmute Kieran. yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's it's typical of very often young people look at politics and say, look, things need to move very rapidly and they are frustrated when they don't. I think in the Irish context over the last decade, we've seen two referenda uh, pass um, quite dramatically, the marriage referendum and the repealing of the Eighth Amendment. But I think it's important for young people know that to know that there's some of us with grey hair who were trying to make this stuff happen 30 years ago, and it, it took a generate more than a generation to make these things happen. So, um, as always, you want things to move very quickly, uh, the younger you are, and, you know, maybe some of the older people as well. Uh, so I think that frustration will remain. I, I guess if I were to sit down, and I did sit down with some, some young activists in Glasgow, I would say, look, 
start working out what's going to happen in Cairo next year. Who do you need to get to to influence the outcome of Cairo? And I would say to kind of Extinction Rebellion and other groups, the big public manifestations are enormously important, but you also need to get to the decision makers and get to them now, 12 months out, rather than with two weeks to go. Um, and that's the long, hard slog of, of policy uh, of policy change. It, 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 it's not easy and you have to prep for it a long time in advance. Yeah, and Robbie, just the same sort of question to you, you know, that disconnect, you know, you, you touched on uh, yourself in your own presentation on, on some of the big achievements, but, but yes, you know, there is a sense that, you know, we are running out of time, essentially, and that these pledges aren't enough. Um, you know, how, how would you sort of, you know, uh, marry the two, the, the, the expectation versus what, what actually the outcome was? I, th I thank God there's huge frustration is the only way I'd put it. I think if there was apathy, it would be, it would be far worse. I think we need it. Um, I, I, I mentioned there on that project shaping, we, we uh, engaged with the Youth Council of Ireland and we had a number of events. And, and uh, for me, they were the standout event of the last uh, uh, 12 months really on that project. And believe me, you me, I had a lot of events like this uh, in the first half of this year, but it was just so much energy, so much uh, uh, like like real like good ideas. Uh, and I think that's, I think that frustration, if we don't have that frustration, we're absolutely hurtling towards disaster. Uh, and I think, look, we're absolutely, it's, we're, I think we're disappointed really uh, with, with the ultimate outcome, but I would go back to that point. Look, it's, it is, I think we're getting there, but not at the pace we'd like to. Um, Anna, what, what do you make of that message from Kieran to, to your young students that, you know, this, this type of change that we're talking about, this, this massive reorganisation of how we live, how we work, you know, it is going to take time, um, despite the fact that, you know, people people know it needs to happen quickly, but just that this gradual glacial pace of bringing 200 countries along with you is what's going to take time. I, I mean, I think um, at a global level, it's going to be very glacial and incremental, but I, I would encourage young people to, to continue to push for rapid change because you can, while, while sort of global energy systems do transform slowly, you have at a country level seen rapid transformations when, when you've got the conditions right. So I, I think that to keep pushing and for the transformations that, that are necessary um, can still be effective at the national level. Uh, and then that has, you know, knock on effects at, 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 at these in these global fora, we can be parts of these coalitions of the willing, but not unless we're actually making these um, these changes as, um, you know, our, ourselves. Um, I, don't, I would also say, though, that it can you, it's easy to suffer from burnout as, you know, to sort of watching this and, and to sort of to keep seeing it on, on social media and, and to, to be obsessed with it or, you know, to, to really think about it. This is this is not going to be a marathon. It's going to be a uh, sorry. This is going this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you know, even if we do have emissions to 2030, there'll still be an enormous effort to to push for a net zero as quickly as possible before 2050, if possible. and to get to negative emissions, I mean, there'll, there'll need to be a whole new set of solutions to deal with um, adaptation and, and damages from climate change uh, and, 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 and global development issues. So this is sort of a, a lifetime. I kind of came to a realization a, a, a year or two ago that I'll still be working in 2050. I'm actually uh, within the age demographic of, of, of your group. So, um, you know, when my, my I've got two young kids and um uh, and uh, they will be uh, at, at, at my at my age they'll be at my uh, stage of their career when they're um uh, when uh, uh, in 2050 so in 2050 they, they will be sort of a, you know so, so this is this is in for the long haul i think and um uh, and 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 people shouldn't uh, feel too burned out i think um so it's it's, it's hard to juggle that um, yeah, look, that's that's really interesting. Thinking of you know where we'll be by twenty fifty, you'll still be working, um, and the kids will be at your 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 level now in terms of their career trajectory. Um, we're going to move on to audience questions. There's a good few coming in, so please keep them coming. Um, Robbie, inevitably, data centres have have featured in in the questions, and I suppose it's directed at you. But I'd be interested to get the views of all the panel on this because it's quite a wide question. Um, what role do you see data centers playing in terms of balancing the grid? Um, should the government grant companies planning permission on the understanding that they use um, batteries, that they back up their own power 
So that's available to balance the grid. Um, can we support new data centers without endangering supply to other users? So that comes from Stephen Troke, and he's fit three questions into one there. So Robbie, I'll start with you, and then we'll, we'll go to the rest of the panel for their reflection on that as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. And thanks, Stephen, for the question. Look, the data center, um, which has been, I suppose, uh, maybe to bring it back a, se a, a step, the digital economy is a key part of, of, of the Ireland economy and is something that has grown a huge amount over the last decade. And if you kind of think it maybe in, in simple terms, the fact that we're doing this call, uh, it, 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 there are benefits uh, to this digital economy on a very practical uh, basis. Look. I think uh, what's going to be very important is, is balanced development of uh, data centers over uh, over the next decade and indeed beyond. Um, I think, look, we have to uh, we have to think about uh, greenhouse gas emissions targets, renewables targets, because as your demand increases, it obviously stretches that. So I think that balance is really important. Uh, I think as well, look, we have to consider the balanced regional uh, development of Ireland. Uh, that was something that uh, really kind of jumped back to us in shaping. And I know I mentioned there, there previously, but particularly when we would have spoken to um, uh, chambers of commerce and local communities uh, out in uh, kind of the regions of Ireland, uh, the need for that kind of less of a Dublin centric approach. Uh, and to that end, in the project I mentioned there, we spoke about large energy users, which includes data centers, but there's other types of large energy users as well. Uh, looking to looking for them to connect in different parts of the country but look i know that the regulator uh, crew uh, is uh, consulted on this earlier on in the year but we'd expect a decision uh, very shortly on that i think look things like backup generation that kind of uh, is definitely going to feature uh, uh, as we look out into the day, out into this decade and beyond Thanks very much. Hannah, to you, any, any thoughts on data centres? I know, I, re I remember just thinking back now to the Clareborne uh, special that she did on the Monday evening. I think your colleague from UCC, Paul Dean, was on and they sort of had the Lego out and they were looking at, you know, the energy that the, that a data centre absorbs. I mean, you know, as, as we look ahead, you know, Airgrid's own analysis projects that maybe we're looking at 30% of our energy will, will, be, will be drawn, will be will be used by data centers, you know, how is that going to, to, to fix overall as we're trying to, you know, rebalance our grids, you know, yeah. low, decarbonize, et cetera? What, what's your own take? Yeah, I, of course I'd agree with Robbie that data centers are an essential part of modern life and the kind of centralization of our data processing into these super sort of centers like data centers is actually a much more efficient way of, of doing it than everybody individually having their own server at home or in the office. Um, but Ireland become a special, specialist in data centers, it, that, that raises huge concerns. So even right now, um, data centers account for about 1% of global electricity demand, but over 10% of Irish electricity demand, and that's projected to grow by, by more than 30%. So Ireland has become a specialist in data centers. And these are huge, huge consumers of electricity. And we have a fantastic grid. Uh, you know, uh, thanks to Robbie and 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 and, um, and AirGrid, really super modern and flexible grid, but it's a small isolated grid, which at the same time of trying to decarbonize and double the share of intermittent renewables, which is an enormous technical challenge. Some of the modeling that we're doing is suggesting that electricity demand could up to double by 2030. I don't want to like uh, make, make Robbie's hairs go, go white, but because, because of the amount of it depends on the, the level of kind of demand that you assume, but the amount of electrification of heating and, and transport and just serving a growing economy and, and, and so on. So if you think, if you believe, which I, I do, that there's a limited uh, extent to which we can grow renewables, you know, we can only put in so many gigawatts a year of, of wind and solar, um, then any additional demand from data centers or other large energy users is going to basically sap the sort of renewables growth. It's going to lead to more emissions. It's going to make uh, the um, emissions targets out of date. And the kind of the backup that they're planning at the moment is with fossil fuels. Batteries would be a good option, but they're just enormously expensive uh, and it would obviously kind of reduce the business case. One other option, technical option, is to agree with data centers that they can that, 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 that they can power down their operations at times when let's say the wind is low and, and demand is high otherwise so that could be another sort of option or that there's on-site generation of hydrogen or so on but i'm not sure if we're there yet with with these with these technical options brilliant cheers kieran any thoughts yeah i mean it, it gets complicated fairly quickly i suppose in the irish regulatory context there's two issues planning permission being granted for a data center and then grid access 
And um, in practical terms, grid access is not guaranteed, even if you get planning permission. So I think the kind of the the kind of the um, saying no more planning permissions for data center is a, is a bit simplistic. Uh, I think we do have to ensure that data centers are um, are using the waste heat uh, within the local community for either for housing or for other uh, buildings. I know the one in Clare is talking about a vertical farm, but I, I kind of I'm somewhat skeptical of vertical farming. Uh, convince me that it's that it makes sense, but um, but also the the battery storage. I I think they do need to provide their own their own on site. Uh, backup and yes that will be expensive and it may interfere with the building with the business case but so be it I mean in terms of bang for your buck in terms of jobs per gigawatt of energy I'd imagine data centers are way down there and I'm not sure if it's the perfect thing that Ireland should aim for in a sense we're going down the IFA route of Ireland's the best place for cows uh, if we start doing that with data centers we need to be a little bit careful that we don't sort of start believing our own stories um, uh, and maybe the tech giants actually are showing us the way a little bit the way google for instance is powering up data centers with the sun around the world so the same data might be stored in asia in the americas and in europe and the data center might be very active uh, during daylight hours so there's some tech solutions there as well but i think we've got to get beyond the belief that um we can always check our our Instagram feed at any point, day or night, or that we can always charge, put on our washing machine or charge our car at 100% extraction from the grid. Obviously, um, peak shifting, demand shifting, saying, look, I'd like the washing to be done at some stage within the next 24 hours rather than right now is going to be a future of uh, a feature of our future electricity demand. And I think, yeah, we do have to curtail our a voracious appetite for data um, clearly it's better than driving to a meeting to do it online uh, but we need to be careful that we just don't gobble up uh, that extraordinary amount of uh, we don't just gobble up all, all the supply that's out there mm -hmm. I do think we're going to see a tremendous amount of innovation in the coming decade yeah. and I think uh, Kieran and, and Hannah have touched on it there there really is and and look to be fair uh, the companies not just the double tech companies but the developers in Ireland are, are look, they are very uh, adaptable they're very flexible they're very very smart um, so I do think that there's going to be a uh, new ideas, new proposals that are going to come on stream in the next decade that we look that that aren't there yet. I often think back to I joined 15 or 16 years ago. I mean I think back to where the electricity industry was then to where it is now, it's literally, there is no comparison. And I think if we cast forward 10 years as well, look, I really hope we'll be saying the same thing again, because I think there is uh, going to be some great ideas and uh, over the coming decade. And there's a lot of money and effort being pumped into, to, 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 I suppose, to look at innovative ways forward. And I, I look, I'm closest to the electricity sector, but look, I'm sure that's the case in other sectors as well. Brilliant. Uh, look, thanks very much for all the comments there. There's a good few questions here. I just want to try and squeeze them in as best I can before we finish up at eight o'clock. Um, Francis Jacobs um, asks a question regarding the European Parliament. Francis is a former head of the European Parliament office in Ireland, and he has a question specifically for you, Kieran, just around the, the role of the EU in negotiations at COPs in general. You know, he says over the years, They've been very active and very, you know, successfully perceived as being, you know, one of the the, the drivers of of the COP agenda. Um, but but they were seen this time as being a bit peripheral, and they didn't take on as yeah, much. Yeah, I, I saw well. that question. I, I saw that question. I, I think Timmermans was trying fairly hard. He was over in India uh, within the last month, and he was on a little bit of a diplomatic mission around the world to make it a success. I raised an eyebrow at the fact that Ursula von der Leyen was not particularly uh, in the mix in terms of commenting on COP or Kadri Simpson as energy commissioner. Now, maybe I missed something there, but you can't just leave it to good old Franz, who's brilliant at talking the talk. I mean, Dombrovskis on trade, uh, Ursula von der Leyen as, as president, uh, Vestager as digital. I just didn't see them in the frame. And you can't leave it all to Franz Timmermans to, to, to make it happen. 
And then there was a related question just about the size of the delegation. Because of COVID, the delegations were very small from the parliament itself. Only the Envy, only the Environment Committee was formally represented. And I sit on ITRI, which is energy and trend, which is transport. So I wasn't there as a formal decade. On the day-to-day -day running of the COP, uh, I think it's the same as it was when I was there in uh, Cancun 11 years ago, that the, the climate ministers from each member state sat around the table uh, with, with the EU delegation, but I don't think the MEPs were invited to that. So I think the parliamentarians at a European level were somewhat distant from the process, but I, I don't think it's been that different in the past. So sorry for the, the complicated answer. I guess in summary, I think we needed more than Timmermans to be talking on behalf of the European uh, Commission and maybe COVID made it a little bit more difficult for the parliament to be as active as it might have been. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant, Karen. Thanks very much. I wonder as well if there was a Brexit element in how much the EU were sort of involved in speaking engagements, etc., uh, from the UK perspective. Um, but a couple more questions coming in. A very specific one, Hannah. I'm going to just throw it at you and see if you can answer it. Uh, from John Leonard. Um, he says, how much methane is emitted from the energy sector in Ireland? Um, and then a, a, another question for you, Robbie, it comes from Andrew McLaughlin. Um, what are the biggest sources of delay in rolling out grid infrastructure in Ireland? So two different questions there. Hannah, you on methane, if you have the answer. Uh, and then we go to Robbie on, 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 the, on the grid. Yeah. 260 kilotons. <laughs> this is the advantage of having uh, Excel, um, you know, the, the, the greenhouse gas inventory open in front of you, um, you know, when, when we're not in a meeting live. So, um, so, so 260 kilotons to give that, um, put that in context, um, that is, let's uh, cook, so less than 2% of our overall methane emissions. So that comes from fugitive emissions from our extraction of natural gas and leakage from our, our, our pipes that that is what is what the inventory the emissions inventory is i don't know how you know validated that is there's parts of the inventory that are that are more or less validated 93 percent of our methane emissions come from the agriculture sector there you go john can't do much better than that for you um robbie over to you next on I, on, on the source of delay for the grid i was relieved uh hannah took that one because <laughs> uh yeah uh the the question it was uh would you sorry would you remind me again uh Dara? specifically the question was and um, what are the biggest sources of delay in okay. rolling out grid infrastructure in ireland look i think I, I think thinking about it in terms of delay is maybe i i look at it in a slightly different way there's different steps you have to take uh, to, to to develop a uh, grid and bring it from concept through to 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 final um to final energization i think look take and say some of the projects we mentioned uh, in shaping look what we have to do first is go out there engage with local communities and talk to uh, on a project by project basis we i mentioned 40 projects there that was looking at it at a programmatic level we have to go out and talk to each individual communities on each project to make sure to take on board their feedback on the specifics of a project that's that's absolutely crucial uh, then we obviously need to bring it through the planning uh, process get our consenting uh, and then uh, obviously subsequent to that we can begin begin the construction uh, and ultimately uh, energize the circuit it can take anywhere uh, look some of these projects take five years any, anything up to 10 years as well they take a long time they're complex and, and i think they they need to be handled in a very sensitive manner one thing we would say is social acceptance um uh, of electricity infrastructure you know there's a very strong correlation there with the timeline uh, uh, for for delivering projects so i don't think there's it's not in the context of a delay look you have to you can't rush these things you have to take your time talk to people particularly local communities take on board their feedback and then move forward on that basis Brilliant. Cheers, um, Robbie, for that. And, and uh, quite an interesting question that's coming here from Neil Martin. Um, Neil Martin, excuse me. Um, and he, he talks about buddying up, um, you know, that you might you might buddy up to big emitters who sort of um, compete with each other and hold each other to account when it comes to reducing their emissions. And he, he asks it in the context of the bilateral sort of uh, negotiations that were going on between the US and China. And, and he says, you know, we could get to a scenario where it's almost a beauty pageant between the two to demonstrate progress um you know 
any any idea, Kieran, on whether that's sort of a, a model that could work if you have two big emitters um, flogging it out to try and so we can get ours down more than you? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think we're looking at whatever works and that could be one way of doing it. Actually, at a city level, the European Commission is, is going big on 100 carbon neutral cities. And one of the meetings I had in Glasgow was with Matthew Baldwin, uh, an assistant um, set gen from DG Move, actually the transport side of the things. So he's trying to get cities involved in uh, essentially, uh, well, not so much a beauty uh, pageant, probably a kind of a a, a, a football uh, league uh, to, to try and um, uh, learn from each other, I suppose, is the important thing of what are you doing in transport? Oh, what are you doing in heat? And I know, for instance, the city of Helsinki held a competition because they have big district heating, but it's a lot of it is run on coal. And they said, look, what are we going to run it on in future? Is it going to be biomass? Is it going to be photovoltaics? Is it going to be um, geothermal? And that's another way of kind of encouraging a little bit of lateral uh, thinking on what can happen. But that conversation about the cities, you know, we, we, we think that countries will do all the heavy lifting, but actually, particularly when you get out of Ireland, local and regional government is really important. So when you look at Austria or you look in Germany, what the lander might be doing in North Rhine-Westphalia or what it might ha be happening in Emilia Romagna in Italy might actually be doing a lot more than the Italian government is doing. So I often, I mean, I have a kind of a, a boring kind of talk where I say, look, it's not just up to global action, it's up to um, regional action at kind of continental level, at European level, at Irish level, at county level, at local authority level, and at personal levels. So we can't just say the country, the government will do everything. I think we have to think about our own lifestyle. Uh, we have to think about, you know, our extended family or our community. I think the focus in Ireland on community action that SEAI have kind of worked on, I think is really powerful. And it works very strongly around Europe of the consumer as a prosumer of kind of supplying their energy to the grid. And I know that's going to happen uh, within the next few months in Ireland. So there's different ways of, of, of tackling this. The, uh, competition between countries, yes, but between cities, but also working at all the different layers of where climate action can happen. Because let's face it, member states aren't going to do this by themselves. And the next time you think about, will I buy a new car? Will I insulate the attic? Will I replace the boiler? A lot of the climate, the big climate decisions will be made there. Sure, countries can make it easier to make the right decision, but they can't kind of come into your house and tell you exactly what mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, yeah. Hannah, I saw you nod along a little bit to Kieran there. Any thoughts on that particular, you know, pairing each other off? I mean, not even necessarily yeah. at the country level, but down the levels as, as Kieran mentioned. Yeah, there's definitely a danger of sort of taking too many learnings from COVID to, to climate. But but one thing that we did learn in, in Ireland is that we have very strong trust in institutions and that we have a lot of social solidarity. So if we understand that we're taking climate action for social solidarity because the sort of the future generations and other people require it from us, then we can kind of gather a lot of momentum in terms of a lot of people changing their, their lifestyles and behavior, not just in terms of what energy technologies they use, but but what their diets are, how, you know, how, how they get around, whether they're, they're walking and so on. So I, 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 I'd say um, I'd say uh, that that, um, that that I would agree with Kieran there. Brilliant. And look, we're just finishing up now. So one final question for, for all of you, and it's, it's related to sort of the issue of a just transition, because we've just talked there about innovation. And I mean, I know, Kieran, you mentioned earlier on, Eamon Ryan, he's, he's forever talking about the opportunities that are present. That's not just this, you know, this looming threat and this looming thing that we want to take your cars off you, et cetera, that it's actually, there's opportunities there within, within climate action, within climate justice. Uh, Robbie, just you, obviously you touched on the, the, how, how different electricity and the grid and the industry is from when you first started out and how you hope that will change. I mean, can you just talk a little bit maybe about the, the opportunities by way of, of job creation, et cetera, that, that you see over the coming decade? 
Uh, look, I think there's, I, I think the, if I'm speaking to the electricity sector, it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's going through a boom at the moment, uh, to be honest with you. We talk about all the work that needs to be done over the coming decade, like the whole, it genuinely needs to be transformed. We need to radically change our electricity uh, grid, build twice as much renewable generation in this decade that has been built heretofore. We also need to develop our, or we call it our conventional fleet. Uh, so, but our, like so a lot of it, probably gas generation, batteries, uh, demands, uh, demand uh, uh, response as well. That also needs to significantly change over the coming decade. So, I really do think it's it's there's going to be tremendous opportunity. Um, uh, at a, I mean, that's looking at it maybe from one particular angle. I think we have to make sure that we enable that opportunity as well, and that. You know, as we are very much focused on things like uh, 2030 targets, that we 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 equally uh, we and indeed we do in AirGrid as well. We have we have specific work programs in place to in, uh, enable new technologies to come onto the grid uh, and um, and 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 identify barriers to whatever the next iteration of a battery is, whatever that may look like. Find that barrier, get rid of it to allow that particular sector flourish as to, to the extent that it will. I think, look, as well, just maybe bringing it back down to the to the real local level, like uh, Kiran and Hannah did there previously. I think that when we were out talking uh, and uh, on the shaping our electricity future, we did so much engagement in the first half of the year. And what really struck me was I, I couldn't get over it. I was probably surprised by it as well, was that desire for microgeneration and the desire for people to, to play a real role in in this in this transition and it wasn't about money or like it was it wasn't a necessarily a commercial motivation obviously it, it's part of it but it was more of a desire to to, uh, to to play an active role and would have heard it again and again and again at all the different engagements and that was it was very much a it was very much a straight up what can we do to to to, to enable this transition at at my level what can i do about it rather than always thinking about the the really big macro uh it's it, the micro too if you add all of that up it makes a big difference brilliant uh robbie cares for that and kieran any any thoughts on the opportunities that it presents yeah i like it, the way hannah said look at COVID, but don't be careful not to stretch the analogy too much but it is worth remembering that period. I mean, in, in the midst of that awful crisis that has killed millions of people, th there, was a, there was a moment in time when you could hear birdsong again. You could walk with your children down the street without being worried about cars tearing around the corner. You spent time in your community with your family. You, you called into your neighbor to see how they were getting on. And I think a lot of those lessons do apply to climate action of, thinking about how you get around, uh, thinking about what you eat, thinking about solidarity, as Hannah said, with your neighbour. And we, we have the kind of the academic basis for doing things like this. Uh, Dr. Lorraine Darcy in, in uh, TUD, a former colleague, has been pushing the kind of active travel. Uh, it's good for your health as well as kind of good for your pocket. And then the issue of clean air. I mean, I'm here in Brussels where uh, constantly the, the level of air pollution is really high and it's mostly cars that are causing that. So I think we can we can tick a lot of other boxes as well as climate uh, if we think about this a little bit. I mean, in some badly polluted cities, it's about clean air. But when I'm talking to my colleagues from R Romania about climate action, that doesn't work for them, but I talk about energy security. So I think we can tick different boxes with different people and get everyone nodding in agreement that we need to do something. Uh, and I do think there are lessons from the last 20, 20 months uh, as to how, how we tackle this. Brilliant. Final word to you, Hannah. Opportunities. Fully agree. There's loads of opportunities. And I'm, I'm, I think that if done right, the, the opportunities and the positive benefits will outweigh all these costs. And there's this kind of glaring headline numbers of the billions that it will cost um, will, will be far less than the inaction. I would leave with a word of caution, though, that if we're too rosy about it, then we might uh, kind of neglect that the that the policies that will be enacted will require kind of painful changes. And if they're not targeted carefully so that right now, frankly, it is it is um, kind of 
carbon tax is, is is kind of a blanket tax on society and then and, and it is people who are well off who get grants to, to kind of go to clean uh, energies and if that continues and I think that there's a change that's going to happen that that's not going to continue that there's going to be more of a rebalancing and that's acknowledged in the climate action plan but if if the government doesn't get that right then they won't bring people along and that will be um that will be a, a big loss Brilliant. Look, uh, we've just we've we've gone over um, slightly there, but I think we could have we could have been talking till tomorrow. There's so many issues we didn't touch upon. I mean, carbon tax. We didn't mention that. I only got a word at the very end. Um, but look, uh, thanks very much for joining us, Kieran, Robbie, Hannah. Um, really appreciate your insights. And again, for the audience for their very active participation, the questions throughout. And um, we'll hopefully be back with an end of year YPN before we finish up the year of 2021 to look back at all the key issues that that happened. Uh, but for now, thanks very much. And thanks very much again to our panelists.